right, our second Doctor of the Day. So <laughs> welcome. welcome, Rachel Russell, who's the Senior Regional Advisor at, at Foundations. And Rachel's going to go through um, some findings from the DFG Children's Summit that we held uh, a few weeks ago in Birmingham. Yeah, it's a hard act to follow, and it's not often I get my, my Sunday name out. Yeah, just, um, yeah, uh, just going to spend about 10 minutes just giving people a feel for uh, what we covered in our second DFG summit. So uh, last year, the summit was around assessment, and this year uh, we had uh, a summit again in Birmingham, um, and this year it was around children and DFG. So the foundation's team were joined by I think we had around 190 odd uh, practitioners um, including occupational therapists, technical officers, um, case workers, managers that joined us um, in Birmingham um, for the summit. Um, hopefully I can get my slide to move just bear with me. So just in terms of why did we feel we needed to do a, a DFG uh, summit for children this is um, a real email that we received, and it's very typical of the emails that we get from, as regional advisors, from um, you guys out there do, doing the job. And I think what this email shows is just kind of the challenge that we, you face, we face in terms of adaptations for children. It shows, obviously, we've got a child with really complex needs. We've got a child where we've already, or the practitioners, the OTs and the technical officers had already previously done something. Obviously, they were trying to involve the parents in, in the, uh, the process and the assessment for, for the adaptations. Obviously, they were they as a team were really struggling to know what to do. Uh, you know, what is you know where's the evidence around what we should what adaptations we should be providing. You know, what what um, uh, solutions are out there? What adaptation solutions are out there? And also, I think really telling at the end of this email, which again we're hearing a lot as as regional advisors is, and I'm sure you are all experienced that you're getting more and more of these types of complex um of uh complex children's cases so the the summit was about bringing together the sector to look at some of those really thorny issues i guess that there are around dfg and uh dfg delivery uh for children now the summit is very different to our road shows and it's very different to kind of a traditional uh conference that you might go to so obviously a traditional conference you're going to be kind of fed information um whereas for us a summit is that opportunity where we can bring everybody together that's got a collective interest in an issue and actually look at collaborating, looking at what the issues are, sharing potential ideas around actually how we could uh, solve some of um, the issues that we have in terms of DFG and, and children's cases. And a summit, this is just a, a definition of a summit, which is about bringing to get together as leaders that uh, collaboration to resolve those real world issues. So that's why we chose to do a summit. And as I say, it does have a very different feel to our road shows um, and it is very different to, to a conference because I guess you're coming to share your expertise um, when you come to the summit. So that's why we did a summit because we need to bring you guys, the sector together to look at actually what are the issues, what are you currently doing? What could be, if we do some blue sky thinking, what could be some of the solutions? The other thing that we always say at foundations as well, and I know this might sound a little bit corny, but um, no matter what role you have in the DFG, whether you're a caseworker, whether you're the manager, whether you're a commissioner, we all have that potential for leadership and, and change. So it um, doesn't matter who you are, um, we see you uh, at foundation as being those leaders for, for change. So just to give you just go through the next few slides just in terms of so you can get a feel for what we did at the summit um obviously we had a warm welcome and then we had plenary speakers so we had steve ford who is the ceo of the royal college um, and he just kind of gave an overview around some of the workforce challenges uh, that there are for occupational therapists and and kind of related that to the work um, around children's we then had um, Luke Clement, who is a professor of law, 
at Leeds University has done lots of work uh, with Cerebra, which is a charity that supports um, children with disabilities. And it's done lots of work. So if you if you Google Luke Clement, Cerebra uh, and adaptations, um, you, that should bring up a few of the reports that, that um, Luke has done with, with the students at Leeds University. What Luke was able to do was, was talk about um, the challenges but opportunities that there are in terms of the statutory duties that housing has in terms of the Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act, what uh, statutory duty that social care has in terms of the Children's Act and um, Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act that still applies to children and kind of looking at actually if we look at children's adaptations in terms of what will the system benefit in terms of if we all work together um, and as I say uh, Luke's presentation was able to kind of bring that to the audience just to let you know that um, all the presentations for the plenary session are available on our on our foundation's website so if you do want to take a close look at the slides that uh, Luke presented and, and those the challenges and, and opportunities around um, uh, looking at this from a systems perspective, they are there. And then we had a, an absolutely fantastic um, presentation by Mark and Rhiannon. So they were bringing that lived experience. So actually, Mark is an occupational therapist. His daughter, um, Rhiannon, is autistic. But what they were able to do was deliver a very pragmatic and um, I think level headed presentation around um, you know the benefits of having a DFG and, and what their family has uh, achieved and, and uh, the outcomes the adaptations of, have achieved for, for Mark and, and, and his family and particularly Rihanna and so he's able to br uh, bring that but also just he uses humour really well in terms of actually some of the challenges uh, that they had as a family. And actually, I think sometimes as an occupational therapist, I think, you know, we work nine till five. I know we, we often work longer hours than that. But I think sometimes, you know, we we, we don't live it 24 seven. And, you know, um, I think what Mark was able to bring alive along with Rhiannon was that actually what it feels to live through the DFG process 24-7. Um, so that plenary session, those uh, three speakers really set the scene in terms of actually some of the opportunities, but also some of the reality and challenges that we experience around DFG delivery for, for children. The meat of the day, I guess, were the four workshops. So we designed four workshops around the common issues that we uh, get queries, emails, phone calls about at, at, at foundations, uh, particularly us as the regional advisors. So we had four workshops and uh, those attending had the opportunity to attend two of these workshops. So we had a workshop that was facilitated by Paul and Luke Clement um, that was looking at integrated funding for adaptation. So what are the challenges? What could we do differently? Uh, Paul had uh, developed a kind of protocol and matrix um, for the uh, summit um, and that's hopefully something that we're, we're going to work on um, but that was what that workshop was about so looking at what the challenges around funding adaptations because as we know with children cases often sadly um, the issues don't fall neatly within the 12 purposes for which you can uh, use a mandatory grant and often the needs uh, uh, are wider than what we can do with the DFG and how do you get everybody else. So that was what that workshop was about. We had a workshop around managing expectations. So how do how do we work really well with families? How do we make sure all the stakeholders work uh, well together in the DFG? We then had the age old issue around actually how do we make best use of the DFG and also ensure that we can kind of future proof adaptations. And then we the, 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 the fourth workshop was around the opportunities, particularly with uh, behaviours that challenge and what are the opportunities and challenges of using technology and innovation for those children with, with complex needs. So there were four workshops. The objectives of those workshops was in I must admit, a relatively short space of time, 45 minutes, to have a really 
in-depth, intense conversation to look at what the issues are, what are the opportunities, and then to help the workshop facilitators identify things and actions that we can take at foundations to move some of these issues on and to hopefully develop resources so that we can improve delivery of DFG. So what I'll do is I'll just go through the four workshops so that you can get a, a sense of um, what what was what kind of were covered in in the discussion. So here's Paul uh, introducing his protocol, looking at the different uh, strands of uh, funding. The kind of key messages there was obviously um, increasing strain on DFG budgets. I think that's due to rising cost of materials, the number of referrals that we're getting, the more complexity of cases that are being referred. There was obviously a recognition and an opportunity to improve uh, cross collaboration across the sector. And again, um, the, the protocol that, that Paul developed enabled that, that conversation around, you know, was this uh, tool a potential opportunity to collaborate? Um, a recognition that perhaps sometimes social care NHS does have a role, they do have statutory duties to meet needs, but actually the challenge then of actually trying to bring those stakeholders to the table sometimes can have its uh, challenges. And then how do you then explore alternative sources of funding? So that was kind of the key highlights from that workshop. This is um, Adam from the OT service, and he uh, facilitated a workshop with Chris, one of our, uh, well, the consultancy manager at Foundations, looking at how we work with families, how, I don't like the words expectations, because I think people should have an expectation of what they, they can get from the DFG, but about how you make sure that people have got real good understanding around the DFG um, and what it can and can't necessarily do. So the key um, highlights from this workshop was that thing around, we recognise children have got uh, specific needs, but how do you balance that with try to find something that's cost effective that also kind of fits within the uh, necessary and appropriate reasonable uh, practicable when we're, when we're thinking about eligibility in DFG. That importance of really involving children and families in adaptations. I think sometimes we want to protect families and therefore we don't get them involved. But I think uh, Mark and Rhiannon's presentation really demonstrated that, that importance, no matter how difficult it is, that importance of involving children and families within that, um, um, yeah, within that process. Interesting point around um, the role of occupational therapists in the DFG process. Often there can be multiple occupational therapists that can be involved in children's cases just due to the nature of those cases. Um, so, yeah, just differing views on what the role of the OT is. And then um, one of the things that came up, which is quite interesting because it's something that we've just looked at in the new DFG approach to uh, the DFG the new approach to the DFG for uh, behaviours of concern is, is making it easier for the family and, you know, really trying to streamline it um, and avoid parents having to get multiple bits of evidence to, to um, um, you know, justify why they need the adaptation. So key highlights from the third workshop was just... Um, um, so this was about uh, future proofing. So just there is constantly in the world of construction, there is always innovative uh, design methods coming into play. And it's about how we keep on top of those innovative uh, construction methods so that we can um, use those to make best use of uh, available space, etc. Again, seems to be a message from from Kate's presentation that, you know, that real importance of prevention, although one of the issues with the DFG, if you look at uh, who's eligible for a DFG, you have to have substantial impairment, uh, which kind of is don't really support that preventative approach. But the importance uh, in terms of future proof and in terms of preventative strategies, because actually if you get preventative strategies in place, sometimes it stops you needing a more expensive um, adaptation. Um, common problem, those 
challenges of, of working with children with really diverse needs and sometimes where you perhaps get two siblings with needs, often they can have quite diverse needs as well. And again, kind of linking into that first workshop that Paul hosted with Luke, that need to you know, join up the system. So how we work better with health and education colleagues um, to deliver the DFG and, and how we work collaboratively to, to achieve that. One of the things that um, Rachel Frondingham and Claire Miller um, introduced um, was the idea of using the PEOP model. And again, you can have a look at um, their slides. Uh, so you can have a look at how they use that model just to shape that conversation uh, in terms of designing something that is future proofed. And then finally, um, we had Ruth and Alan who delivered um, a workshop around technology and assisted uh, technology and innovation. I'll put the wrong title on here, but it should be technology and innovation, uh, particularly around using that in terms of looking at a less restrictive approach um, for children um, um, and all that, th those bits around complex needs and deprivation of liberty. So the key highlights there was around, you know, exploring actually what assistive technology is out there. I think there was lots of conversations around the be balance, be balancing the benefits of assistive technology with that concern around is it a restrictive practice or not. And again, similar to the uh, previous couple of workshops that that importance that, that kind of, and it's a theme through all of them that importance of involving children and parents in the, the process and particularly you know the choice of an assessment so that we get the right choice of, of uh, 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 innovation or technology assistive technology and also um, a key thing that was mentioned here was that need for regular review with technology um, and so that that changes in the technology can may, may be made as that uh, child's needs change. So hopefully that just gives you a feel for some of the kind of key highlights uh, that were discussed in, in the workshop. So just, um, just to summarise, we have written quite a comprehensive report and hopefully um, Dan can post, um, we've, I've written a blog and I've also, we, we've written the report as well that just, um, goes in a bit more detail to what I've discussed here this afternoon around what we found and what we plan to do going forward at Foundations because we just don't want to have a talking shop. We actually do want to um, take away action that will hopefully improve and support what you're doing out there in the sector. So just some highlights. As I say, you can have a look in the main report. Um, there's a table at the back of the report that goes into a bit more detail into what we are uh, proposed action at foundations. And also we are, we've already got quite a lot of resources as well. So we've also signposted in that table to existing uh, resources that will help you with some of the, the issues that we identified on the day. So this first one, we need your help with. What was really clear, and um, obviously one of the benefits of, of the summit is we heard lots of really positive stories, such as the story that uh, uh, Mike and Rhiannon spoke about in terms of their DFG, but there was also lots of other really positive stories around actually when we do collaborate, when we do involve uh, health and education colleagues, if we do involve families, the brilliant outcomes that can be achieved. Now, we need your stories to help us demonstrate that and to share those stories across the sector, because what we know is that when one authority demonstrates that actually when we do this differently, other local authorities are more um, uh, feel more comfortable about um, kind of changing practice and, and, and taking on board that good practice. So again, um, sorry, Dan, um, probably giving you a bit of work this afternoon, but we have got on our website an area where you can submit your DFG stories. Doesn't have to be war and peace. It can just be a really quick story about something that you've done that's demonstrated good practice in the delivery of DFG for children. Um, and if we can collect those stories from you, it means that we can promote that good practice and demonstrate that these things can be done. So. Obviously, we'll, we'll be championing that. Um, 
we will look at developing one of the things was around that return of investment so um you know if we look at systems approach to outcomes of dfg so if we do an adaptation it means we stop x amount in care costs so hopefully we'll be working on a on a tool or um, a guide that will help uh, demonstrate that return of investment there are also we've already got an evidence base on our website uh, that uh, that also covers some other existing uh, reports and um uh, research papers that demonstrate that as well but uh, hopefully we'll get something a bit more specific around children and again the Cerebra report that is also on our website is another good way tool that you can use at the moment. We're already working with Alan um, developing a, uh, a guide in terms of the DFG and assistive technology so hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be publishing that and also Mark Pierce, who's one of our regional advisors for the east of England and East Midlands, is doing a fantastic piece of work. Again, collecting your what you're doing out there um, to develop around a, a searchable database so that you'll put in the issue that you're having or a solution that you want to look and then it'll come up with some solutions. Uh, and again, you can find about more about that on our website. Um, We'll do some, one of the things that came up was around looking at training needs around um, helping upskill ourselves uh, around children. So we'll, we'll be working with you to get a better understanding of, of what, what gaps there are uh, in training and how we might be able to support that at foundations. One of the things that we constantly do um, is advise government. That's one of our roles on behalf of uh, the department is advise uh, government in terms of the real world issues that you're having and what would good look like. So we'll continually advise because it was something that was brought up in in in. Um, at the summit is around the limitations of the current uh, uh, upper limit in terms of the mandatory. So that is something that we'll continue to advise government on around the challenges that that, that has on uh, you guys doing job out there. Obviously, again, in terms of the role that we'll, we have with the department is, is obviously, and again, if we can get your stories, it really helps us to inform um, 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 who we work with at the department uh, to really show the benefits of, of doing that preventative approach. So again, can't stress strongly enough the need for those um, uh, those stories. So please, but yes, please uh, think about submitting one. Um, Again, we are working with um, Invisible Creation around the Fit for Our Future campaign because one of the things, again, that was mentioned during the summit was that need to work even better with housing associations. So I haven't got time this afternoon to talk about the Fit for Our Future campaign. Um, uh, again, uh, hopefully Dan might be able to, or somebody might be able to just to put a link so you can explore what that um campaign is again but there, there again I think that's an opportunity for us to use that campaign to uh, kind of promote the fantastic work that we can do with housing associations um, particularly addressing children's needs around adaptations. Again one of the things that was mentioned was um, that we're already doing is housing assistance policy and how you can use your housing assistance policy um, to deal with these more complex cases so uh, this is already available to you so if anybody out there is wanting to look at how we can better use our housing assistance policy to uh, del deliver dfg even better to children please contact us because uh, we can look at working with you on that um and as i said we're just going to do some a little bit of extra work on the funding protocol that paul um develop for the for the workshop and hopefully we'll, we'll we're going to get try to get a little bit more feedback and look at publishing that as well as i say in the main report there's a lot more information on there in terms of um other bits and pieces very simple things that we can do that will hopefully um improve what you do make life easy for you, what you do out there in delivering a dfg so please have a look at the report and as I say, if there's anything ongoing that you need support with, remember, we've got the five regional advisors. We're here to support you. Uh, so please, please get in touch um, if there's anything that you want us to follow through with. 
Um, yeah, so just really, really quickly, I think this photograph of Mike and Rhiannon kind of sums it up because actually when we get DFG delivery right, this is what we see. We see a young person that, you know, was able to participate in, in, in a conference or, or the summit. Um, and this is why we do the DFG. And those are just some um, kind of conclusions. So, uh, yeah, just the, the opportunities that we've got through the summit and ongoing work. And that's it. And there's a link there to the report. Great. Thank, thank you, Rachel. That was, um, oh, it was a good day, wasn't it? Good day. We had a good day in Birmingham. And... Um, I think I think as you say, kind of Mike and Rhi having Mike and Rhiannon there really set the scene for the day in, in terms of um, some of the issues they faced and, and some of the benefits they've had from from going through the process. And I, th I think kind of my takeaway from the day was that um, that these kind of big and complex cases, even referring to them as a DFG, probably isn't particularly helpful because they're not they're not actually DFG. Kind of DFG goes up to thirty thousand if you're talking about something that's that's 200,000, then if I do my maths right, DFG is only 15%. So it's, it's thinking of them as, as DFG, I don't think it's particularly helpful. Um, so, th so that's, I think, something we'll be working on is, is looking at different ways to approach these more kind of complex cases that don't assume that they are DFGs. Because I, I guess kind of back in 1990s, 2000s, there weren't that many cases that were much more than the the upper limit but now that there are um it, it's it's very different and, and taking the same approach clearly isn't clearly isn't working i thought i think i thought um luke made a really good point in his presentation i think what we forget is that social care has always had a responsibility for adaptations well before we had the Housing Grants Construction and Re Regeneration Act, because obviously in the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, which was 1976, is it? What? 1971, what? oh, even older than I am. Um, <laughs> it, it's, in, it's in there in terms of the duties that social care has in terms of provision of adaptations. And I think what we've forgotten with the DFG is, is, is that link with social care particularly for children, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's 1970. Oh, no, close. Oh, yeah. Close. <laughs> but yes, yes, so, so I think I think more work. And I suppose the other thing that did come out was that um, a looked after child in residential care can cost £280,000 a year. And uh, kind of social care sometimes spend, can spend like that, whereas spending £200,000 on adaptation can take years to agree yeah. and kind of during that period of time that that could have been spent two or three times in terms of social care costs um so it, it it's kind of a different way of thinking i think yeah. well hopefully big thing that comes yeah. from the from the summit um but it was a good day it's a good day and um we're, we're, we're thinking about what we might do for a future summit so if, if anybody has any suggestions on big and thorny issues around home adaptations or perhaps home modifications or home improvements, then uh, please get in touch with We'd love to hear from you. But um, thank you, Rachel, for that, um, that um, whiz through what we discussed on the day. Thank you.